We are back. Today we're talking about random variables, expectation, variance, independence, covariance, and correlation. We're gonna keep everything in a discrete setting, making it as intuitive as possible. We're gonna go over the idea of expectation and variance when we have scaling and shifting, how the analytical expression can be interpreted in the context of both the expectation and the variance. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about that in conjunction with uh, another random variable. So when we have two random variables uh, in the same expression, how can we apply these these operations to such expressions? Then maybe we'll sprinkle in some simulations and some Python to help out with the, the intuition here. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna keep everything in a discrete setting. So this, the discrete expectation is going to be defined as some LaTeX in here math b b e of x where x is a discrete random variable is going to be equal to sigma so we're summing over a such that the probability of a is greater than zero and the sum that we're actually computing is a times the probability of a okay so this is the expectation the expected value the average the mean of x Okay, so we're summing over where A is some outcome, we're multiplying that with the probability, where the probability is strictly greater than zero. That right there, that sum across the entire space of possible outcomes is going to be the expectation. Okay, don't get it necessarily backwards. This is not the most frequent outcome of the random variable. This is not the expected value as weird as that is to say. Um, and you'll see why in a moment, but um, this really is just a measure of the space. It's the first moment. But if you're actually going to ask somebody and, and think about how hard it is to answer this question, if I asked you what is the expected value, could you tell me what that was without saying, oh, it's the average or, oh, it's, you know, what we expect the random variable to be most of the time like that that's the wrong interpretation really the correct way to interpret it is in terms of this summation that is the product of the outcome with its corresponding probability uh, across the entire space and you'll see why those interpretations are wrong when we go over this dice roll example um, something as simple as the average you may have been interpreting wrong forever um, and that's just really interesting how quickly probability and statistics can make things uh, that you thought you knew um, very confusing. So let's just talk about this dice roll. Dice roll example. So if we have a dice, right, we know the probability uh, mass function for that corresponding outcome of a dice roll. That is, we have P of A. So we'll say P of A is equal to it's just equal to one sixth, where A is the outcome of the dice roll. We know this could be one, two, three, four, five, or six. And then we also know that anywhere else we are gonna have zero, okay? So if this is our probability mass function, we know that we can reach one, two, three, four, five, or six. Those are our outcomes with one sixth, one sixth probability each. If we abide by this definition of the discrete expectation, then we're going to restrict the domain to that where the probability of A is greater than zero. That would be where A is one, two, three, four, five, or six. We're not looking at 1.5, we're not looking at zero, we're not looking at seven, we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then we're going to sum these products. We're gonna sum one times the probability of one, which is gonna be one times one sixth, then we're gonna sum two times the probability of two, which is one sixth. And we're just gonna go ahead and do that for everything in this domain here, okay? So if I was to do this analytically, what this would look like is applying this formula, we would have essentially this would be the expected value of a dice roll random variable x, we would have math b, b, e of x 
is equal to, we would factor out the 1 sixth because we have a constant probability for every single outcome. And then all we would have to do is sum from i is equal to one all the way to six. Okay. And this would be the expected value of our dice roll here. And we could do this in Python relatively easily. I'm gonna say import numpy as mp. I'll say, I'll do this in a new cell, might as well. I'll say a is equal to mp dot array, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then if I was to compute this sum right here, then all I would have to do is I would have to say s is equal to sum a, print s divided by six, right? Because we're multiplying by this one sixth out in front of the summation. Uh, that would be the same thing as multiplying this by one over six or just dividing the final product by six and we get our 3.5, okay? So this is literally what's happening if I was to call something like mp.mean of a, I get 3.5 as well. Um, that is analytically what is happening behind the scenes, right? We are just going to go ahead and sum up the product of all of our outcomes with their corresponding probabilities. And that is going to be the expectation, the expected value, the mean, the average, so on and so forth, right? But I, I mean, it's kind of silly, right? Because 3.5 is the expected value. But <laughs> Is 3.5 possible with our dice roll? No, right? I don't wanna harp on this all video, but this is exactly what I'm trying to say is like, we actually interpret the average wrong most of the time, wrongly most of the time, right? If I was to say, oh, it's, you know, the value that we can expect the most from a random variable. It's like, no, that's actually not the case at all. Um, in fact, that would be probably the mode, right? Because the mode would be the value we can expect the most. Um, the median would be our middle value, right? Maybe the median is, is um, located with the mean. Then we have that the mean here, the expected value, uh, aligns with the median and we have some symmetry. Or maybe, you know, there, there's all these different uh, aspects of, of uh, a random variable that we have to consider. But, you know, that's something that we need to consider as well is that the formal definition of the expectation is not that it's the most popular outcome or anything like that. Really, all it is is this summation of the product of possible outcomes with their corresponding probabilities. That's what an expectation is, right? If you told me, hey, like it's the most popular outcome or it's what we expect the outcome to be, then do we expect it to be 3.5, the dice roll? No but there are other statistical implications, right? Of what 3.5 could do for us, right? Maybe if we were like, hey, you know, we wanna roll a dice and we wanna get a dollar value for whatever value we roll, right? One, two, three, four, five, or six, we would win one, two, three, four, five, or six dollars. But we're playing a game and we're saying, hey, um, you get one re-roll when should you choose to re-roll statistically? What would be the, the implication there? Uh, if you rolled a four, then the expectation would suggest that you probably don't wanna re-roll because you would do worse typically. But you know, if you were to roll a two, then statistically it's saying, hey, you, you could do better. Um, so that's how you would you know, use and leverage the, the expectation. Um, but don't get this whole idea twisted. It's actually kind of weird once you actually try to formalize the interpretation um, because it's not the, the most common outcome or what we can expect to see most of the time. Uh, really, it's just defined in terms of this, this sum product here. Okay, enough harping on that, all right? Uh, hopefully I made that point clear and hopefully I made the point of how we can use it clear. Now let's talk about this idea of linearity among expectations. Okay, so suppose we had some sort of transformation to our random variable x, okay? So we're gonna scale our dice roll by r, and then we're going to shift it by t. 
the question that I have for you is how does this affect the overall expectation? Okay, well, let's think about this in terms of the definition of our discrete expectation here. This is a summation. So a shift in scale should work relatively nicely because everything is linear, okay? Hence the linearity of expectations, right? So if we were to go ahead and shift everything by T, okay? Forget about R for a second. Suppose R is one. What happens with the summation? Well, we're gonna have our new T term, right? Because everything is shifted, okay? So essentially we would have this A plus T, right? And then we would have this, this shift that's constant to the entire space, okay? So really, the only thing that's gonna happen with a shift is the entire expectation is going to be shifted in that direction as well. So it may be uh, a little confusing perhaps, but really whenever we shift the random variable x by t, we're just gonna shift the entire space by t, right? Because if we have one, two, three, four, five, and six, then all of a sudden I shift everything up by one, what's gonna happen? Well, one's gonna go to two, two's gonna go to three, three's gonna go to four, four's gonna go to five, five's gonna go to six, six's gonna go to seven, right? And then we're still gonna have this summation across the space, then we're gonna divide by this one sixth, and we are going to have just the entire shifted expectation. So it's gonna be the exact same thing um, as shifting the whole expectation rather than uh, doing it one at a time. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, if I was to take MP array one, two, three, four, five, six, and through broadcasting, I was to add a T, and I would say T is equal to one from that previous example. Then if I was to take this mean, I would get, look, 4.5. Okay, if I was to shift it by five, I would get 8.5. The original expectation was, if we recall, 3.5. So all I'm doing is I'm shifting every point by T. And if I shift every point by T, then I'm just shifting the original expectation by T as well. Okay. So we could see that here through broadcasting. Or what I could do is I could say for I in A. So let's just go ahead and make A the original vector, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up with that summation. So I'll say S is equal to zero. And then I'm gonna say S plus equals I plus one. So this is going to be adding that one, two, one, and then two, then three, then four, then five, then six. And that's the exact same thing that we talked about up here is A turns into A plus T. If we come down here, I can either multiply this by one sixth or do it at the end, S divided by six, I get my 4.5, right? Because I'm shifting by T, when in this case T is one. So hopefully this makes sense. I'm breaking down the steps, but really we have this summation here. So this sort of transformation plays very nicely with the expectation operation, right? So we know that the T is left unaffected, okay? So we know Whenever we have a shift, we can just pull it outside of the expectation. So we can shift the final value essentially by T. But what about a scaling? How does a scaling affect it? Well, think about the scaling. We pretty much do the exact same thing with the one sixth probability. We've been doing it at the end, right? We divide by six. Well, what if we had RA here? This is a summation. Can't we just pull the R to the outside of the sum? We sure as heck can. Why can't we do that with the A and the P of A? Well, because A and P of A are dependent on the term in the summation, right? So we can do that with the one sixth strictly because it's constant across the entire space, but you know we don't necessarily have that in the general sense. So in this case, if we had RA or RA plus T, well, we know that the T is gonna shift everything the R is just going to scale the original expectation because we can pull that R to the outside of the summation and then we're just left with the original expectation. 
So let's go ahead and hammer this point home as well. So I'll say r is equal to two. If I do r times this vector here of all possible outcomes, then you'll see our original expectation of 3.5. We multiply it, look, we get seven. Okay, the same thing is gonna be true here, where if we take a look, we have, again, I have to make this one, I'll make this the original expectation. Now, if I multiply each one by r as well, right, where r is going to be two, we will also get that seven. Okay, so the second one here is us throwing the r in the summation, essentially. That's what the for loop is acting as. It's acting as the sum, okay? And then here we're applying it more directly. So we know that we can just take this r outside of the expectation. And this is exactly how we should think about the expectation operator, essentially, okay? So whenever we have a scaling by r and a shift by t, we can just take the scaling factor outside of the expectation, multiply it by the original expectation. We can take the shift outside of the expectation as well and just shift the entire scaled expectation. Very important, you do not apply the shift prior to the scaling because t itself is not affected by r. Okay, just keep that in mind, okay? So now we can go ahead and see, right, if we have an original expectation here of 3.5, if we were to shift by five, scale by two, should be able to do this in your head, right? Because you scale 3.5 by two, and then you get seven plus five, it's gonna be 12. Yeah, we get 12, okay? So that's how we can use the linearity of expectations here. So that's gonna do it for expectations. Hopefully this was clear. Hopefully you see now why this is such a useful idea. Um, and it turns out that we don't necessarily need variable independence. Uh, in fact, we actually don't need variable independence to apply the linearity of the expectation. So this linear property here um, to multiple random variables in the same expression. Um, of course, uh, we have to be very careful when we have a products of, of different random variables. But it turns out if we have two random variables that are or are not independent, then we can still distribute in this same fashion, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment after I talk about variance. Okay, so let's talk about variance first. Variance is an elusive topic. Um, once again, it can get very complicated very quickly, but we're gonna talk about everything in the context of a population variance here uh, a discrete population variance. So let's just talk about discrete variance. I'm gonna say bar of x is equal to, and in this case, we're trying to come up with a measure of expected deviation from the mean, okay? So if the mean is a measure of the average, the expectation, uh, so on and so forth, all the different names for the first moment, then the variance itself is going to be a measure of the expected deviation from that particular value, okay? And what this looks like in terms of expectations is it's going to be the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x quantity squared, okay? This isn't the formal definition, um, if you will, because here what I'm doing is I am just going through and applying this rule that you can derive from the formal definition. Really the formal definition is looking at the difference between an outcome and the expectation. And when you have that difference, you have to consider the distance. So you would look at either an absolute value or a square. Uh, and in the case of variance, you look at squared deviations. Um, so this is a consequence of that definition. If you go ahead and you just you know, distribute everything out, you can reduce it to this guy here. And this is definitely the most uh, widely used formula for variance. Uh, and then you'll also have, of course, like your 
have your, your sample variance formula, sample standard deviation, so on and so forth. Uh, but here we're talking once again about population variance. All right. So how can we calculate the population variance of a dice roll? Well, let's just go ahead and take this vector here and let's compute these two expected values. We already know what those expected values should be as we've defined the discrete expectation right here. So I'm gonna say A is equal to this vector and we will multiply it with itself, uh, element-wise product. I believe that's the Hadamard product um, and we have this guy here. And if I was to say X2 is equal to MP mean of A, then we would have our E of X squared. And then we're just going to subtract off the expectation of X, which we know is 3.5 squared. Okay, so I'm just gonna say B is equal to the original vector. Uh, and then I'll say X is equal to MP dot mean B squared. And then here we will print uh, the variance. We'll say X2 minus X print V and we get 2.917 ish. So that is going to be the, the formal variance. Okay, so that is the uh, expected deviations from the mean squared <clears throat> of our dice roll. Okay. So now what I'd like to talk about is this idea of a shift and a scale. Okay. So now we have a shift T and a scale R. How does this affect our original random variable variance? Well, in this case, it's going to be relatively difficult to see. So perhaps we should look at the formal definition of variance here. We'll have one over N and then we have sigma, and then we'll sum over x minus math db e of x squared. And then this would be math bb e. Yeah, okay. So here we see now the formal definition of variance. We have the expected deviation um, squared, right? That's exactly what we're looking at here. Um, I might be a parenthesis off or so. Um, but in reality here, what I'm trying to get at is when we have a shift, right? It's gonna bug me, so let me just add this guy. Okay. Okie dokie. So what I'm getting at here is if we have a shift by T, then how does this affect the deviation from our expectation? Does it affect our deviation from the expectation? To illustrate this, I would really like to make a plot. So import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a random vector x mp.random.normal 0, 1, 1000. And then we'll do, um, actually, this will be y, and x will be mp.a range 0 to 1000, I believe. Um, maybe 1 to 1000. Want to make sure that they're the same size. We'll do zero to 1000, up to but not including. PLT dot plot, and then we're gonna plot our X and our Ys. So now we have this noise, maybe a scatter plot would actually be better. Yeah, okay. So now I need a horizontal line, um, X, it's, isn't it H line, X H line then mp.mean of y. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, and then color equals red. Nice, that's exactly what I want. Okay, so let's illustrate this point, right? So all of these points you can think of uh, as outcomes of our random variable. And you can think of this line, this red line as our mean, okay, as our expectation, our average value here, all right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure the expected deviation squared um, from the mean, all right? Ignore the fact that this is a sample and not the population, all right? I'm trying to show you what happens when we shift by this T, okay? Should it affect the variance, okay? Variance is gonna be essentially the distance, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead, so I don't accidentally resample this. I'm gonna put this in a new plot here, okay? So remember, variance is trying to measure the deviation of this point from this red line. This point, this point, so on and so forth. All of the points to this red line. If I shift every point, so if I say plus T, plus T, and I make T equal to 100, right? If we look at this, right? Look at this plot. Did anything change this point's deviation from this line? What about this point's deviation? This is the original plot. No, the only thing that shifted was the axis, where it is in space, not its relative distance from the mean. Okay, this is very important. You can see it clear as day here. Shifted by T, the relative distance of this point to this line does not change. This is that same point, and that distance is the exact same to that line because the mean shifts by 100 and that point shifts by 100. Okay, so T shouldn't affect the variance at all, and it doesn't. So we can just go ahead and throw that out. We can throw T out. Any constant, any shift that's inside a variance operator, we can throw out. It's not gonna affect the variance, and it shouldn't. This is literally why. You can see it in this chart. Like this isn't like, oh, you know, this is the idea. This is literally why we don't see it, okay? What about a scale? How does this scale affect it? Well, hopefully it's a little more clear here, but if I was to go through this guy and scale the random variable by R, we no longer have this linearity. We have this quadratic nature of the variance operator acting on the original variable with the scaling R. So R is actually pulled out and squared. So this operation here on Rx plus T is r squared variance of x, okay? So if I come down here, right, we can see this by scaling all of the points here by r. So I'm gonna say r is equal to two, okay? Now I'm gonna have r times y, r times y. If I run this, watch what happens. Look at the deviations. Okay, what about R is six? Hopefully this is becoming a little more clear as we see the scaling here in a relative sense is different, right? It's gonna be different than just a simple shift you can see it relative from this point to this point. But this is where the, um, <laughs> the relative distance of this point to this is changing from this point, say, to this point, okay? But we can see this uh, more clearly when we actually compute the variance itself. So let's just go ahead and do that. So hopefully the, the charts were, were helpful. Now let's go ahead and look at the actual analytical solution. So we have this guy here, um, if we were to compute the variance in closed form, then we would have B, B D O F is equal to zero. This is our variance, right? So this is our original dice roll. If I was to multiply B by R, so let's say R is equal to five, T is equal to 10, then what would I have? I would have B, R times B plus T, and then we get R times B plus T is 72, right? 
let's make T100. Doesn't affect it, right? Doesn't affect the variance, and it should not affect the variance, right? We can add zero, it's not gonna affect the variance. But this scaling factor will, right? So if we have it as one, we have the original variance. As two, we multiply the original variance by four. We can see that here. So we're scaling r is two, take the original variance, multiply by r squared, and we get the exact same value. Okay, and that is just going to be a function of the quadratic nature of the variance operator, okay? It is no longer linear. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say for how we can use variance um, and use the expectation uh, in the context of some sort of shift and scale. Um, what, what becomes pretty interesting too is you'll see a lot of the times we multiply by the square root of 250. Um, it's pretty interesting because if you think about it, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, especially in finance most of the time, we're trying to annualize say like portfolio variance. And if you wanted to multiply X by 250 or 252 rather, then you would have to multiply by something squared. So if we multiply by the square root of 252, then this square is implicit and it's going to essentially multiply that out there. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, if not, let's take a look at a quick example in the context of annualizing portfolio variance, right? So we have, let's say that the variance of X is equal to T, right? And we want to annualize this. So we would have uh, 252, um, we wanna multiply X by 252. So then we would have something along the lines of um, times 252. So we would do, let's see, how do I wanna explain this? We would say that Let r equal mp dot square root of 252, then r squared variance of x is equal to variance of r times x, which is equal to variance of 252x times x. Maybe that's a little more clear. So suppose X is a stock return set and we want to annualize variance. We multiply by square root of 252 as we have variance of square root of 252 X is equal to 252 times the variance of X, which is equal to 252 times sigma squared. That's probably more clear, okay? So this is how it would be used in, in practice, for example, right? So if we know this equation, right, and we wanted to annualize uh, a stock return set, then we will multiply the original data by the square root of 252. Um, and then the reason we do that is because the variance is going to be scaled by 252 uh, in this context here, right? We have 252 times sigma squared. Okay, hopefully that's clear.
This would be an example of where we would apply something like this. I'm gonna digress from that. Um, I just want to sprinkle in a little more quantitative finance and I know that the idea of annualizing variance can be kind of confusing, but hopefully that's more clear now because we went over um, how this sort of scaling works. Okay. Alrighty, so now I think it's time to talk about the idea of independence, okay? Um, we talked about how if this, um, if we have two random variables that aren't independent, then we can still use the linearity of expectations, but that's not necessarily true when we have uh, variance, especially some sort of scaling shift and then maybe another shift by another random variable. Turns out that independence does matter quite a bit um, in that context, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to say that I have, um, let's say two random variables, okay? Let's just go ahead and create a new section here. Talk about two random variables. We'll have random variable X. We will say that it is distributed normally we'll say standard normally. We'll say we have y is equal to 2x plus 10. Okay, so we have two random variables here. x is a random variable, in this case it is now continuous. Uh, we have y, which is a random variable. In this case it is a function of x. x is a random variable, thus y is also a random variable. Okay. Are x and y independent? Well, we know y is defined in terms of x, so no. No, they're not independent. But can we still apply the linearity of expectations? Turns out we sure can, okay? So let's look at this idea. Here's the solution to the following equation. So what if we have rx plus t plus y, we'll say 2y plus 5. And all of this is in an expectation. Well, it's pretty easy actually, because we know we can apply this linearity of expectation right here and just distribute this expectation to random variable x, random variable y. So this is going to be equal to, maybe instead of two and five, we'll just use X and Z. So then we have R times the expectation of X, right? Plus T plus X times the expectation of Y plus Z. We're just, just gonna go ahead and distribute that expectation to our random variables, okay? What is the expectation of X? Well, that's gonna be zero by the standard normal, standard normal uh, density here. What is the expectation of Y? Well, if we apply the expectation to Y, we're applying it to two X plus 10. We know the expectation of X is zero. The expectation of a constant is just gonna be a constant. So we know that that's gonna be 10. Okay, so we can actually just go ahead and solve this directly. It's actually quite easy. We can just go ahead and plug in whatever numbers we want and we will get the desired solution. So I'm gonna say, right, we know this expectation is zero. Then we have T plus Z plus X times E of Y, which is just gonna be 10. So this is gonna be equal to 10 times X plus T plus Z. That is going to be the solution to this guy right here. 10x plus t plus z, okay? Well, we can go ahead and test this out. We could say x is equal to mp.random.normal, 0, 1, we'll do 1,000. y is equal to 2 times x plus 10. Let's just verify we have the right vector, yep. So now we have x and y. Let's make it 10,000 so it's a little closer to what it should be. Again, this is a simulation. This is a sample. Central limit theorem law of large numbers is going to make this uh, approximately this solution. 
I'm not going to talk too much about that. I have other videos on that if you are interested. But let's just go ahead and look at this analytical solution here, right? So we're saying that the expectation of this guy here is 10x plus t plus z. So let's define everything. R, t, x, z. We'll say r is 5. We'll say t is 7. We'll say x is 3. Z is 4. Okay? So now we're going to print 10 times x plus t plus z. We get 41. Okay, what is the actual analytical solution here? Let's go ahead and compute it. We should have, we're gonna have ex is equal to mp.mean x, ey is equal to mp.mean y, and then we're gonna print, what is it? r times ex plus t plus x times ey plus z. And then we get 41.278, and that's pretty darn close to 41, our analytical solution. This is our simulated solution, the exact same thing pretty much, right? If I keep running this, it's going to converge to that 41 right here, okay? So <clears throat> here we see that we can apply the linearity of the expectation to two random variables, even if they're not independent. We didn't check for independence. We didn't care about independence. We got the right answer. Okay. What about in the context of variance? How does this affect variance? Well, it turns out variance is actually quite uh, dependent on independence. <laughs> dependent on independence. Jeez Louise. So the fact that these two are not independent is going to drastically affect the corresponding variance. Okay. Really, what that means is we can't distribute nicely like we did here. Uh, in other words, if I was to have these guys in the context of variance, so let's come down here and take a look at variance. All right, there we go. In the context of variance here, we are going to ask, does the variance of x plus y equal the variance of x plus the variance of y? Right, and that's a fair question to ask because we know that the expectation of x plus y is equal to the expectation of x plus the expectation of y, even without any sort of independence among the variables. So is this true? Is the variance of x plus y equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y? Well, we can just test this. We can just test this, right? We have x and y. We have a, a sample of x and y. And we can go ahead and we can compute the variance and see if they're the same, right? So what I'm going to do is, and bear with me, I'm just going to use the population variance. I'm going to say vx is equal to mp variance of x, ddof equals 0, vy equals mp dot var or variance of y, ddof equals zero. And I'm just going to go ahead and print the variance of x plus the variance of y. And that is going to be this right hand side over here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum the two random variables. So I'm going to have z is equal to x plus y. And that's actually going to give me a, a new vector here. And I'm going to compute mp dot variance of z ddof zero. And if you take a look here, we actually don't get the same variance. So this left hand side is not equal to this right hand side. Okay, and that's pretty interesting. But why is that the case? Well, it turns out that we have to take into account the way that these variables are related to one another. And that is going to be given by independence, whether or not they are independent. So if they are independent and y had nothing to do with x, this would be true. But because y is defined in terms of x, they are dependent. And we're going to have some covariance. Okay. So I can compute the covariance. I can say mp.cov. And I can use the x and the y vector here to compute the covariance. And if we look at the covariance of x and y, there's a symmetric matrix, right? We have the covariance of x and y on the off diagonals here. 
I'm just gonna go ahead and grab that element. So I'm gonna say zero, one. This is gonna be the covariance, okay? Maybe I should specify DDOF equals zero. Now, here's the interesting thing. Do you notice that this right-hand side could equal this left-hand side if we include the covariance? What I mean is, let's do XV plus VY plus two times the covariance. Now, what do we get? We get the variance of the sum. So it turns out that if we have the covariance term, then we have this equation being true. So maybe this equation really isn't true. Um, but really what I'm trying to say is when we add this covariance term back, we can make it true. So this is not true in general. So this is true if the variables are independent. But if the variables are dependent, like in this example, then we can see that we have to add back plus two covariance of x and y. And that's exactly what we get here. Okay, you can see when we add back the two covariance of x and y, then we just go ahead here and we get the original variance of x plus y. All right, so that's pretty interesting. So this is gonna be true in general, okay? And the reason this is true in general is because if we have that the random variables are independent, then we have that the covariance is actually gonna be zero and those two random variables are gonna be uncorrelated, okay? So that's a pretty interesting result here. And we can go ahead and test that actually by creating another normal sample. Um, but in reality, this is really what I wanted to cover in the context of covariance, right? That is this idea that the variance of X and Y uh, is not equal to the variance of X plus the variance of Y in general. That is unless we have independence. Otherwise, we have to consider this covariance term to make this equation true. And that's exactly what we see here. When we consider covariance, we have the right-hand side equal to the left-hand side, um, where if we have the lack of the covariance term, we just consider the sum of the two variances, we're missing that value of four, the twice the covariance term. So that's just something very important to hopefully, uh, hopefully this is visual enough to see this idea right here. Okay. All right. So that's pretty handy. That's pretty interesting. We talked about expectation variance, covariance. Now, what about the idea of correlation? Well, really the idea of correlation is to attach some sort of interpretation to covariance because covariance is kind of confusing, right? Like what is this? What is covariance of X and Y? Well, it turns out if we were to expand the variance of X plus Y, uh, formally in terms of the definition of variance, which we've defined up here, then we would find that the covariance of X and Y is equal to the expectation of E X, whoopsie, of E X Y minus the expectation of E X E, Y. There we go. So this is actually how we define covariance. Uh, and we can actually see this. We can see this directly. Um, if we were to go ahead and compute, um, let's say Q is equal to, we will do X times Y. And then we do EQ is equal to MP dot mean Q. And then we do EX, which I believe we still have. Yep, we do. So we could do um, EQ minus EX times EY. And we get that simulated uh, covariance, that 2.012, uh, right? 
And that's exactly what we had here when we called our numpy covariance function, right? It's exactly what we had. It's the exact same thing. Okay, so this is just how we would compute it directly by hand using this guy here. Okay, but this is still pretty confusing, right? Because if I have a scatter plot, I already imported matplotlib. So if I did plt.plot, we want to plot x's and y's together. Let me do a scatter, okay? Scatter plot here. Then this is a, a very nice interpretation of, uh, of what we got cooking here strictly because we have such a nice definition of y in terms of x, it's just pretty much a line, right? What if we also had another normal distribution? Um, we'll say plus maybe, we can add some noise perhaps. Let's do x plus, well, how should we define this guy here? Maybe this is sufficient enough x plus y. Now let's add some noise. We'll add um, n to comma five. Okay. So we're gonna add some, uh, some noise here with a mean of two and a variance of five. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here. I'm gonna say plus mp.random.normal two and then five. I think that's standard deviation. Is that standard deviation? Let's see, 25, yeah, plt dot scatter, x, and then a. Dang, that's still very linear. Oh, it's broadcasting, that's why. 10,000, there we go. There we go, that's better. That's what I was going for. 225, 10,000. It was broadcasting a single draw from the uh, normal distribution. But now we have 10,000 random normal points, 225, um, that's what we were going for, right? So we have two and then five, there we go. That's what we're looking for here. Um, how do you interpret covariance in this context? Right, like the expectation of x y minus expectation of x times expectation of y. There's there's not much to interpret there, but it turns out if we normalize this this idea of covariance by the variance, the square root of the variance of the product of uh, x and y, then we end up with something that's far more interpretable. So if we decide, hey, we take the covariance of x and y, and we divide out the square root of the variance of x, variance of y, we get something called rho. And rho is a correlation coefficient that is always going to be in between negative one and one. So this turns out to be quite handy because now we have a very simple interpretation of the relationship between x and y based on some sort of, of linear scale, if you will, uh, from negative one to one. That is, the closer we are to one, the more positive and linear the relationship, um, and the closer we are to negative one, the more negative and linear the relationship. The closer we are to zero, the more uncorrelated we are. And it's pretty cool because if you were to scale any of these, you can check this by scaling any of these uh, these random random variables here, you'll see that scaling doesn't affect this correlation coefficient. So if we multiply x by r, then we pull out r here, right? And then if we multiply x by r here, we pull out the r, but it's squared, but it's still underneath the square root. So it turns into r, and then the R's cancel. Okay, so in other words, right, it's not gonna affect anything. If we have R and then R, right, this is gonna be the same thing as we take an R out of the covariance, and then we take an R out of the square root, 
right? And then they're gonna cancel. Because remember, we have r squared outside and then we have a square root and that turns into r. And that's gonna cancel at the top and then we're just left with the original definition of row. So this sort of standardization, um, turning it into this, this range from negative one to one is gonna make it far more interpretable. And that's how we can actually go ahead and derive this correlation coefficient, which is quite interesting. So let's go ahead and do this. So let us take MP dot core of X and Y. Is it correlation? I don't even remember. Core coef. Core coef X and Y. Okay, and uh, the core coef here is one, not really a shocker because we have uh, a function, a direct function of the random variable X here. Um, but let's go ahead and add some noise. So mp.random.normal uh, to five, 10,000. Uh, there we go. Now we have our correlation coefficient here. Um, I'm gonna make this actually fixed as A. So I'll have um, A is equal to Y plus some noise then we can compute this correlation coefficient as 0.34-ish. Uh, now, if we go down, we can use the formula that we have up here. We'll just standardize that covariance. So if we have this covariance here, then we would do the covariance of X and A. We're going to say this is the cove. We will say S is the normalization. We'll say MP dot square root. Then we need the variance um, v of x is equal to mp dot variance variance of x ddof equals zero variance of a mp dot variance of a ddof equals zero square root of x um, I'm sorry vx times va and then if we take the ratio that is the covariance over s we get 0.34 and that is matching the solution from NumPy. Awesome, so that's just about everything I wanted to talk about today on uh, the context of independence, the context of variance, expectation, covariance, and correlation. Um, we could see that if these guys are independent, oh, this is actually the last thing I wanna to touch on. The last thing I wanna to touch on is this idea of independence um, and covariance being zero. So if the variables are independent, then covariance is zero. But covariance being zero does not mean the variables are independent. Okay, and that's very important. If you have a zero covariance, that does not mean that the two variables are independent. It does mean, however, that they are uncorrelated. Independence is far stronger though. You can make uh, far more, uh, you can make use of a far uh, large number of, of theorems and uh, and corollaries from from uh, from independence, but not from from uh, lack of correlation. Okay, so that's very important to go ahead and understand there. Okay, let's see if we can maybe wrap this up with an example. So x is equal to mp dot random dot normal zero one ten thousand. Y is equal to mp dot random dot um, Poisson, maybe? Five, 10,000. Vx equals mp dot variance, x ddof equals zero, vy equals mp dot random dot, whoop, dot variance of y ddof equals zero. Print, um, we're going to do m do vx plus vy and then we can do x plus y mp dot variance ddof equals zero and there we go we have an example here of where the correlation uh, i'm sorry the uh, well subsequently the correlation but also the covariance uh, is almost zero via simulation so we could say that they are in fact uncorrelated 
um, but we can't say anything about their independence. It turns out they are independent by the way that we've constructed them. But if we look here, we can see that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are about equal, right? And that is because the two variables are in fact independent. Okay, but of course this is a simulation, so we're gonna have uh, some unintended noise that's going to act as some sort of correlation, but this is so arbitrarily close to zero that you can just say that these guys are uncorrelated, but we wouldn't be able to say anything about their dependence or independence if we didn't know their governing distributions here. Okay, so just a quick recap. I just wanna go over everything one last time. Um, we have this idea of an expectation. Again, this expectation is not you know, what we would expect the outcome to be, but rather it is the summation of the product of possible outcomes with their corresponding probabilities all across the particular space in which you were looking at. Uh, in this case, we looked at a dice roll example. We computed um, the idea of the linearity of expectations. That is, if we have a scale and a shift, what does that look like? We talked about this idea of, of a scale and a shift in the context of variance as well, variance being the um, expected square deviations from the mean, from the expectation which we defined prior. Uh, we talked about an application analyzing portfolio variance, that is, uh, why do we multiply by the square root of 252? And that is because if we multiply the data vector of portfolio returns x by the square root of 252, uh, then it turns out that we are going to be able to go ahead and find the variance multiplied by 252. That's going to give us the annualized variance here. Okay. Alrighty. Um, and then we took a look here at this idea. Um, we took a look here at this idea of... <coughs> Of distributing the uh, the variance, we have a shift. The shift doesn't affect the variance, doesn't affect the uh, the deviations, the expected deviations, but the scaling does. Um, and we we saw that here with the r squared. And then we took a look at two uh, random variables, um, and we talked about solving um, some sort of summation of different random variables using linearity of expectations, uh, even if those two variables are not independent. In this case, they are dependent. Um, but we could still use that property. Here's a simulated solution. Here's the precise solution. Uh, we talked about that in the context of variance, how independence is important. Um, talked about how this idea is true in general. Uh, and then we talked about the definition of covariance and correlation, how correlation doesn't change even when you scale the original data, which is quite nice. Uh, and then we talked about this idea that just because two variables are uncorrelated, does not mean that they are not dependent. We do not know anything about their independence via correlations. All right, that's gonna do it for this video. I think uh, the only thing that I wish I went over a little bit more is this example with annualizing portfolio variance, but I will digress for now. Perhaps we'll talk about that in another video. That doesn't look entirely correct to me, um, but that was kind of just on a whim ad hoc. I'd like to talk more about that another time. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you found this video useful. Um, you know, this is a lot of probability, a lot of um, statistics in this particular uh, example here. Um, well, not, not really a lot of probability. We bridge the, some of the gap of probability with CLT and law of large numbers implicitly. Um, but I hope you found it useful. A lot of useful stuff in here. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below or join my Discord. Please join my Discord. We, uh, we are getting a lot of new members every day, and uh, it's always nice to talk to everybody in there. Go buy my courses. It helps me out. helps me make videos like this one. Uh, of course, if you enjoyed it, please leave a like, subscribe. Other than that, I will see you in the next one. Thanks.